All right, hey everyone. Thank you very much for coming to my talk. I really appreciate it. <laughs> uh, my name is Cameron Bloom. I'm the product manager for surge pricing at Uber. And today I will be explaining why we chose to tile the earth with hexagons and to tell you a little bit more about our system for tiling the earth with hexagons. So a uh, brief agenda, we will have a history of surge pricing. We'll talk about why we chose hexagons and we will then introduce some, I'll introduce some, some of the basic things about the Uber H3 hexagon library, but some of the subsequent speakers will be going into more depth. So first off the history of Surge, uh, let's think back to Uber in 2011. So Uber had created a system for matching riders with drivers, they had some apps, um, and that worked pretty well. But when you have a system like that, you very quickly run into a problem where you have more riders requesting than there are cars. So all the riders request, all the cars get matched with, with riders. And then if more riders want to request, the app basically breaks. The product becomes unusable. There's no cars. You can't get where you're going. So the first challenge for Uber back in 2011 was do not run out of cars. <laughs> so this is what they came up with. <laughs> and what this is, is it's a real-time uh, pricing system that looks at, at feeds of data for, that represent uh, supply and demand and sets a price that applies both to the driver and to the rider. And it's citywide, so one price for the whole city. Uh, this is what it looked like when it was deployed for New Year's Eve 2011-2012. I love the left-oriented uh, picture there that couldn't get into the center. And basically you'd request and this would pop up and it would say, prices are 6.25 times higher than normal, is that okay? Um, <laughs> so um, this helped, this definitely helped the problem. But uh, if you think about running a system like this citywide, that, that has some pretty severe drawbacks. Uh, certain parts of the city would be, uh, have you know, plenty of cars and no problems, and other parts of the city might have no cars at all. And if you're trying to make a compromise with a real-time pricing system across the entire city, then you'll start running into some problems. So next problem we needed to solve was, how do you not run out of cars in a neighborhood? This is what we came up with. We drew a bunch of geofences. So, uh, went into Chicago, for example, and set, drew a whole bunch of different geofences in different neighborhoods as we defined them, and then let each geofence in real time look at supply and demand data and set a price for both riders and drivers in a real time system. And this was a major improvement. So now drivers could look at the app, they could see where the high demand was, and hope, hopefully they would drive towards it, and then the higher prices would reduce the demand in those areas, and, and we could balance this out. So this definitely worked a lot better than the first version, which was the citywide system. But um, we kind of ran into a new problem when we did this. We started hearing reports that drivers were canceling rides of the riders. They were rejecting their requests and canceling. And we needed to dig into this and figure out what was going on. So um, here's, here's what the analysis of this was. So here's a picture of San Francisco. Got a whole bunch of different geofences. These geofences represent different levels of demand. And you can think of the red and the dark red geofences as having enough of a supply demand imbalance that the surge pricing system would decide that we need to surge in these areas. So if you're a driver, let's say you're here and you look at this map, you say, okay, dark red, that's pretty close to me. I am going to drive over here. But uh, probably run into is this boundary effect with what we call price cliffs because each geofence is making its own decision for how to set a price. If you walk across that invisible line between geofences, your price can change dramatically by like, you know, could be 4X normal rates down to 1X normal rates just by walking across the street. Um, so back to the driver, if you're here, the driver's gonna look at this geofence, this dark red and say, oh wow, I bet there's a lot of demand there, I bet there's just riders everywhere. And in reality, actually all the riders might be up in the financial district. So they go park themselves in the geofence, and then a rider shows up over here and says, okay, let's request, and the matching system says, oh, there's a driver right here, let's match them over. But the driver gets that request and says, I'm expecting surge pricing, and there's no surge pricing on this request because the driver's outside the surge area, or the rider is outside the surge area, so they reject it. But in the meantime, they're not actually positioned close to where all the demand is because all the demand is in the financial district. So they just sit here waiting and they think they're going to be getting a lot of requests, but in reality, it's actually might be a long time before they get a request. So we had a, a, a new set of problems that we needed to solve. 
So we had this kind of phantom demand problem uh, where we, they would go into the geofence, their location in the geofence might not be near where all the demand is. So we could create some expectations about how long it was going to take for them to get matched with a rider. And then uh, another problem was scalability. So as an example, this is a picture of Paris. Here's all the geofences that we drew for Paris. Paris is a huge city. Uber does a lot of business there. We, a lot of different neighborhoods, we drew all these geofences for all these different neighborhoods. And at this time, this is like 2015, 2016, Uber was growing very fast geographically. So we were moving into dozens of new countries, hundreds of new cities. These cities were growing very fast. You can look at this list of what we're dealing with here. And a lot of times we would launch a new city, we'd go and we'd draw geofences, and then that city would grow. A couple months later, all those geofences would no longer represent the underlying data, and we'd have to go redraw the geofences. And there was no way we could keep up with this anymore. So we had some pretty massive scalability challenges. So one more issue here. Cities don't look like this. Like when you look at the actual city, it doesn't divide itself into geofences. Uh, cities are continuous, they're complex. They look more like this. And we needed a system that could actually represent dynamically what a city looks like and wouldn't be confined to these definitions of these geofences that we were drawing. So the solution we were looking for needed to have smooth gradients. We wanted to get rid of these price cliffs that we were seeing. Um, so it, you know, don't walk across the street and get a vastly different price. We wanted to have a clear center of demand so that a driver would know exactly where they needed to drive to, rather than just being in this big fence, but maybe not actually being close to the demand. And we needed to have neighborhoods that weren't confined to these definitions that we were drawing you know, weeks in advance, we needed to have neighborhoods that, that formed dynamically with, with the movement of the city. And to create a system that satisfied all these requirements, we decided that we wanted to use a grid system. The picture here on the right is what we ended up building, and we decided to use a hexagon grid system. So what I'd like to talk about is why did we choose hexagons for this grid system? Why not something else? Why did we go and build a hexagon grid? So on to the second point, why hexagons? So let's talk about grids. There are three regular shapes that you can use to tile a grid, uh, triangles, squares, and hexagon, or hexagons. This is, this is what they look like when you tile them out. So we wanted to come up with a framework for how we would choose the best one of these. So we came up with a couple different criteria. We wanted to look at neighbor traversal, we wanted to look at subdivision, and we wanted to look at distortion. So let's start with neighbor traversal. Triangles, if you want to traverse from one triangle to the other, there are just, just within the, the adjacent triangles to the center one, there are three different ways to do it. You could go from edge to edge, you could go from point to point, or you can go from point to off center point. And if you're trying to come up with a system, for example, that aggregates data inwards, uh, to the center point from, from the neighboring areas. This is a solvable problem, but it's a huge headache. It's, it's a lot of work to deal with that. Squares are in better shape, so you have edge to edge, and you've got uh, point to point, so you've only got two different ways to, to deal with that. It's better, but still a problem. Hexagons for this specific problem are in the best shape because traversing from hexagon to hexagon will always be the same distance. So of the three choices, Hexagons are the best solution for neighbor traversal. Next one is subdivision. So if you have a square grid and you have like a big square and you wanna subdivide it, it's very easy. You just cut it into four, you end up with four squares, cut it into four, end up with four squares. Hexagons have a little more trouble with this. It's not as clean of a solution, but there is a way around this. So, what you can do is you can think of one hexagon as seven hexagons just slightly up rotated and offset from each other. And then if you need to go smaller than that, you can pick another hexagon, take seven hexagons, rotate them again slightly, and now you have a hierarchical system. This is more work to make, but it is a workable solution to the subdivision problem. So uh, hexagons are not the best in this category, but, but we have something that's workable. Now let's say you were given a problem, you wanted to represent the space of the state of California 
but you didn't want to use a tiny little hexagon grid. You wanted to do it in as few hexagons as possible. Uh, using this system, it would look like this. So you start with a bunch of big hexagons in the center, and you use the tree, and you go down the hierarchy, and as you get to the edges of the state, you get to smaller and smaller hexagons. So this is, this is what a practical application of this would look like. This particular example uses four different hierarchies. If you compare just using the smallest of the four to using all four with this hierarchical system, you can compress your storage by about 9x using the system for the California example. So there is a lot of compression savings with this. It does work pretty well. Okay, on to the third one, distortion. We are on Earth. Earth is a sphere, basically. Spheres are not flat, grids are flat. So this is the problem that map makers have been dealing with for centuries, is how do you create a flat representation of a spherical object and how do you solve this problem? Uh, so here's some solutions that people have come up with over the years. The solution we were particularly drawn to is the Dymaxion projection down here, which is a sort of a jagged fold out made of a bunch of triangles. I'll get back to that in a second. This is a, so the, the, the picture on the left here is a common solution if you want to take a square gridding system and how you make that fit the earth. You project the earth inside a hexahedron. We chose to use an icosahedron, which is the shape on the right. You can think of this as a D6 versus a D20 or a cube versus the 3D shape, but not, not, not the pyramid one, the, the, the other one. So the next step when you're taking this approach uh, is you take the points from the, the outside of, of the shape and you need to kind of squish them down on, on the pointy parts that stick out so that it, it goes flat with the earth. And you can see here what happens when you take the hexahedron and you do that and then what you do when you get the icosahedron and you do that. So why, why bother with such a fancy shape? Why not just use the cube? And the answer is distortion. We get a lot of benefits from distortion. So think here, you're inside the center of the earth. There's the earth, there's the cube on the outside. And the worst case scenario for the distortion you get is going to be on the edges and the corners. And the worst one that you're gonna get is about a 45 degree angle. If you take the same exercise, here's the center of the earth, there's the earth, and then there's the icosahedron around the earth, the worst case scenario around the corners and the edges is only 31 degrees. So you end up in a lot better shape. The, the worst case scenario distortion isn't as bad. There we go. Now we've got a cool animation here. This is back to the Dymaxion map. So here's the Dymaxion map of the Earth. And what's cool about this is all the points of the triangles are in the water. And the points are the places that have the worst distortion. And for Uber's purposes, we are a land-based company. So the part of the map that matters the most where we want to, to use, get the, the least amount of distortion is, is on the land. So if we can hide the worst distortion in the water, that actually works out really well. And you can see here the whole example of starting with the Dymaxion projection, folding into the icosahedron, then folding it again into the sphere. So let's compare this to the S2 grid. This is a square-based grid and look at some distortion examples. So here is the building we are standing in on S2. You can see that 555 Market Street at the pink dot is actually inside something that's pretty close to a diamond. Uh, with the hex grid, we get a little bit of distortion, but it's, it's a pretty clean hexagon, so that's good. Um, let's look at Uber's headquarters in Amsterdam. Um, S2 does better here. It's, it's, a, it's not really a square, it's more of a rectangle at this point. And H3 is a little worse, so you got a little more distortion there, but that's still a pretty clean hexagon, and that's you know, one of the worst situations we'd have to deal with. So in terms of distortion, we, we feel that the hex grid, specifically this grid with the Dymaxion projection, has a lot of advantages in the distortion department. All right, and on to the library. So I'd like to talk about the global gridding system that we came up with. And then we can talk about some use cases that hopefully will lead into the other talks that are to come where more people will talk about all the different uses that we have for H3. So start with the icosahedron again, smoosh that in, you get these curved triangles. Then what we did is we put a pentagon at every junction of those lines. And then from the pentagons, you can draw hexagons outwards. And this creates a set of base cells for the grid. 
So at the highest level, we have 102 base, 122 base cells, including 12 pentagons. Then we apply that hierarchy system where you take the hexagon, you draw seven hexagons, you slightly rotate them, and we created a hierarchy over the earth that lets you zoom in all these different levels. So here is an animation of what that looks like for this building. So start at the big one, you can go in, they're rotating just a little bit, all the way in, all the way in, all the way in. There's the little courtyard in front of the door, and you can find a hexagon that's as small as you could possibly need, just that little part in front of the courtyard. All right, so um, I won't get into any of the details about the underlying algorithm behind the surge, surge pricing, but for the grid system, we did come up with a really good application within surge pricing that created a vastly superior version of surge pricing that was able to solve all these problems with smooth gradients, clearly centering demand for drivers, dynamically generating neighborhoods, dynamically shifting the patterns of pricing across the world. But there's a lot of other applications for this too. So for example, you can take this type of grid and you could use it for traffic analysis. This is just uh, the level nine hierarchy uh, with a bunch of traffic data underneath it. So you can see where traffic's flowing through the city, intensity, you can see the two freeways there. Um, pretty much any problem that requires geospatial sharding would be a good application for H3. And it's a great visualization tool as well.